Welcome to the Nicholas 11X12 technology. Today we're looking at the Intel Core i5-3570K Ivy Bridge processor. This is the flagship model of the Core i5 series. Before I continue, I'd like to thank Fortacus for providing me this product and I'd really recommend that computer store and online shop. But now let's move on to the box. Again, we're looking at an Intel Core i5 CPU which is unlocked and unleashed. And that's because it's the i5-3570K which uses the LG1155 socket just like every other Ivy Bridge CPU does. On the side you will get to see some highlights of this processor like the new Intel HD Graphics 4000. On the back of the box there is a description in different languages. On this side you will see some more specifications like the frequency, cache and PDP. On the top you can see the CPU itself inside of the box. But now let's open this box up and see what's inside. Alright, here are the Intel Core i5 installation instructions and on the back is the Core i5 sticker. Of course the CPU also comes with a heatsink which is this one. It's kinda small but it should do fine. Thermal paste comes reapplied already. The fan uses a 4 pin header and here's the processor itself in a plastic case. I'll quickly open this up so you can take a closer look at the CPU. Alright, and here's the CPU which looks very nice but standard at the same time. For this review I'll be installing that CPU in the MSI Z77A-GD65 motherboard which I already reviewed earlier before. I also didn't go with the heatsink that came with the CPU. Instead I went with the Cooler Master V6 GT aftermarket CPU cooler. Now to the specifications. The Intel Core i5-3570K is a quad-core Ivy Bridge processor that has a base clock of 3.4GHz and a turbo clock of 3.8GHz. It also features the new Intel HD Graphics 4000. This CPU has a TDP of 77 watts and uses the new 22 nanometer architecture. 1 MB level 2 and 6 MB of level 3 cache are offered and dual channel DDR3 1600 memory is supported natively. Here in CPU-Z the processor gets detected without any problems and once again we're looking at an Ivy Bridge CPU which uses the LJ1155 socket. The TDP of 77 watts got lower compared to the previous generation Sandy Bridge CPUs with the highest TDP of 95 watts. The new 22 nanometer technology is used and the voltage got a little bit higher compared to Sandy Bridge. This will probably also affect temperatures and that's because of Intel's new Tri-Gate technology. As you can see the latest instructions are supported and right now the processor is running at 1.6 GHz on idle. But it will go all the way up to 3.8 GHz once Turbo Boost kicks in. And since this is a K-series processor it will overclock very easily because it has an unlocked multiplier. So this would be one of the main reasons to get this 3570K over the 3550 for example. Here's the cache and this is a quad core CPU with 4 threads. Only Core i7 CPUs feature Intel's hyper threading technology which have the double amount of threads. So this is just a quad core and will also act like one other than an i7 CPU as an 8 core or 12 core. I installed the CPU and the MSI Z77A-DD65 motherboard with the latest BIOS version at the time of this video. For the memory I got 8GB of DDR3 2000MHz RAM installed. This is a great great benefit of Ivy Bridge, it allows a lot more frequencies on the memory. For instance, I couldn't achieve 2000 MHz on this kit without overclocking the platform. I could only run this kit at 1866 MHz instead of 2000. But yes, this isn't a problem anymore with these CPUs. But now let's move on to the benchmarks. This is my test system. The 3D Mark Vantage at the performance preset is first, of course. The CPU score is 21,249, which is quite high for a quad core, but actually, I was a little disappointed here. There's almost no performance boost over the i5-3550, which I reviewed earlier before. I'm not saying there's none, but you just get a boost of roughly 1,000 points, which isn't a lot. For the price difference, well, it's not the best deal. But now to the performance alone, yes, it's a very high score for a quad-core CPU and it will handle games and applications very well. But again, to me it looks more as if this CPU should be overclocked. That was a little different on the i7-3770K. It was meant for overclocking and brought a decent boost for a good price. Next benchmark is 3 Mark 11 at the performance preset of course. My system scored P4193 with this processor. It's a pretty good score and you will be able to play games at ultra settings. Of course keep in mind that this was tested with the GTX 560 non-TI version. 
In Cinebench release 11.5, the CPU got a score of 6.36 points here, which is very nice in general, but there's not a huge difference again over the i5-3550. But performance-wise, it will do pretty good at rendering. Of course, it can't compete with a Core i7 CPU, but these also cost more. In 8064 cache and memory benchmark I got some nice memory transfer rates and latencies as well as good cache transfer rates. It doesn't matter of which type of cache we're talking, it's fast. The latencies got so much lower which is good and yeah the memory bandwidth got higher as well. And here as you can see turbo boost kicked in with 3.8 GHz. Now I'll let the CPU calculate 1 million digits of pi. It's done in just 9.656 seconds which is fairly fast for the price and I can't complain. Next I will run W prime and will let the CPU calculate 32 million integers across all available cores. It's done in 9.736 seconds which is quite similar to the previous result in Super Pi. Again I can't complain here this processor is just plain fast. But now let's move on to the game benchmarks like their 3 at 1680 by 1050 on ultra settings. The frame rates look very good with 49 fps in minimum and good 59 fps in average, so there's no lag in sight. On to the second game then which is Battlefield 3 at 1680 by 1050 on ultra settings but the MSAA turned off and the AF low to 1x. The minimum frame rate is 46 fps, 60 fps on average and great 79 fps at max, so you really can't complain here. For gaming you definitely wouldn't need a Core i7 CPU at all, really there's no need. A Core i7 CPU is recommended for multitasking, heavy video or image editing and so on. I'm not saying this Core i5 CPU will not do the job good or so, no, it'll do these just fine, but it'll be slower in certain tasks. Please keep in mind that I ran this test with the GTX 560 non-TI version. And if you're already talking of GPUs, I should also not forget to mention that this 3578K features the new Intel HD 4000 graphics, just like the i7 3770K does. Of course you shouldn't expect performance numbers like you saw it with the GTX 560, but the integrated graphics should be okay for basic usage. Just to give you an idea on how the performance would look like, I ran a similar 3 d Mark Vantage test at the performance preset. As you can see, I got the exact same GPU score like on the 3770K, which would be a 3367. But just in case these numbers don't tell you anything, I'll run Dirt 3 at 680 by 1050. Yes, you heard right, but everything else at the lowest settings. Here I get 29 FPS in minimum and 41 FPS in average. Now in Battlefield 3 at 800 by 600 on the lowest settings possible, the results look a lot worse. I get 14 FPS in minimum, 27 FPS on average and 38 FPS at max. So this is definitely not playable, especially at these settings. But Intel made a big step forward compared to the Intel HD 3000 graphics on the previous generation Sandy Bridge CPUs which scored only half of the HD 4000 graphics. While it's a big step forward, the graphics processing power still isn't good enough so you won't be happy when it comes to playing games. But on the other side, the iGPU wasn't made for playing games anyways. But now let's take a look at the temperatures. On idle I get around 26 degrees Celsius which are 79 degrees Fahrenheit. On low the temperature goes all the way up to 63 degrees Celsius at max, which are 145 degrees Fahrenheit. The ambient room temperature was at 21 degrees Celsius, which are 70 degrees Fahrenheit when I ran the tests. So for my personal taste I can't complain on the temperatures. Yes, they are a little bit higher than Sandy Bridge, but Ivy Bridge just operates at a higher temperature and that's it. This could of course affect overclocking in some point, but you should be fine. It wouldn't be necessary to run the CPU with a huge aftermarket CPU cooler like I did if you're running this processor on stock speeds. Again, I personally can't complain. The final test would be the power consumption, but unfortunately I can't deliver you the results since my watt meter broke and I couldn't get a replacement at the time of this video. I guess it would draw like 60 watts on idle and 115 to 120 watts on load with the GTX 560 on idle, but again, I don't know. The Intel Core i5-3570K is a pretty good CPU overall. It would be perfect for playing games, so there's no need to get an i7 CPU, but I don't quite think this i5-3570K is worth the money compared to the i5-3550. But if you're planning to overclock, well, go ahead, this would be the right choice. As for the other tasks beside gaming, it'll do fine, but the Core i7 CPU like the 3770K which I reviewed too, would do all these tasks better, just gaming wouldn't make a difference. While the i7 CPUs are targeted towards the enthusiast, i5 CPUs would be meant for gamers. Pros are, very good performance, it plays games just like a Core i7 CPU, then it's fully unlocked so you can overclock it easily, 
I'm not sure but the power consumption should be quite low even if I couldn't check it. And this CPU also supports high frequency memory and allows more variants of frequencies. For the cons I only have one thing to say and that would be it doesn't have the best price performance ratio. Other than that it's a great CPU and I give it a 9 out of 10 and would definitely recommend it. Again I'd like to thank Fortacus for providing me this product and I'd really really recommend the computer store and online shop. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.